Well, hello, everybody. This is your favorite speaker, Dr. Ronald Brown. And our topic for today is 9-11. Famous September 11, when the World Trade Center was totally destroyed. Well, I was living in New York. I was living in Queens. And when I heard from my neighbor who yelled over, turn on the TV, the World Trade Center is being attacked, or New York is under attack. We didn't know at the time it was going to be just the World Trade Center. Well, while everyone else was fleeing Manhattan, I jumped on the train here in Queens and went to Manhattan. And I was taking pictures and uh, collecting accounts of what people saw, what they heard from the Queensboro Bridge. I watched the collapse of the second tower going up the mushroom cloud, which happened. I talked to people who were working at nearby churches, ambulances, and everything. So this is probably one of the most significant experiences in my years here in New York City. Well, interestingly, at the very same time, I was a docent, which is a guide, at the New York Historical Society. And so every Saturday and very often during the week when I would go in to give guided tours of our ongoing, ever-changing exhibit of 9-11, I not only saw what I had seen, I not only got stories from people, but I was peppered by questions, by anecdotes, by stories. Sometimes a tour which was supposed to be about an hour, well, it would be long over and we would be still standing there talking, exchanging stories. So our topic for today is 9-11 and what emerged eventually over the months and over the years as the official narrative of 9-11. Being here in New York, working at the Historical Society, having spent the day of September 11 in Manhattan itself, I was exposed to history. And at the Historical Society, I was exposed to the writing of history, the making of history. Reminds me of the old adage that laws are like sausages. You don't want to see how they are made. Well, official histories, whether it's Howard Zinn's very popular A People's History of the United States, or whether it is an official account of the events of history, whatever they are, they are a narrative written by people, written by organizations, and so many things are left out that we experienced, those of us who lived in New York, and especially me at the Historical Society. So um, that is going to be our topic for today. On the left, you see the outline. What was going on at the New York Historical Society during the crucial period before and after 9-11? What happened on, nine, on Tuesday, 9-11? What was I doing? Then my Saturdays at the New York Historical Society. And then a couple of the chapters that were left out. For example, the big controversy about the experimental architecture of the skyscraper. The casualties, how many casualties were counted? Who was not counted? The mysterious film crew that was arrested and uh, interrogated for several months and then everything about them disappeared. And then the compilation of the official history of 9-11. So, Let's get going on my very personal account of what happened on 9-11 and what was my role in this. So, first and foremost, the New York Historical Society, where I had been a docent for many years, uh, was 
founded in 1804. And as you can see from the picture, it was a bunch of white hair, white bearded old men with canes and top hats who were out to preserve the history of New York. Now it has a hyphen in New York because in 1804, New York, New Jersey, New Amsterdam were all hyphenated and it was expected that sometime the words would merge. So we get names like Newark, which was originally in 1804, New-Ark, as in Noah's Ark, because it was founded by Puritans, but the two words merged. Well, New Jersey never merged, and New York never merged, and it lost its hyphen. I, got, I often wonder if New York had merged into one word, we'd have something like Nork, which wouldn't be a very romantic name for a city. Well, on the right, you see the present home of the New York Historical Society. Big, beautiful building on 8th Avenue facing Central Park, uh, just across the street from the Museum of Natural History. So in September 11, the New York Historical Society was already close to 200 years old. Well, the old crusty men with their white beards who had been the mainstay of the historical society for so very long, gradually were dying out and fewer and fewer new people were leaving their fortunes to the historical society. And so the society was on the verge of bankruptcy as we approached 9-11. In fact, it finally reopened on a reduced basis in 1995 after having been closed for several years. That's when they brought on people like me as a docent. And I would take groups of people around and describing the different exhibits. Well, the old timers, the old uh, white bearded men with top hats who were still hanging around were really irate because they figured if a person visiting historical society didn't know who Thomas Cole was, they had no re reason to be in the historical society. Whereas the new management decided that the historical society should be an educational institution. It should be not only a historical society, but a museum in the modern sense. My favorite exhibit was the Lumen Reed Gallery, where the Thomas Cole paintings, five paintings of the course of empire, predicted the future rise, flowering, and decline of the new nation, painted in 1836. Top is the America where the first immigrants arrived, in the middle, we see the culmination of the city with the Hudson River and the Atlantic Ocean in the distance. And then at the bottom, you see the wars that are going to destroy the city. And finally, desolation, the end of New York. So this series of paintings really brought home the delicate nature of a city, the delicate nature of an empire. Empires, yes, do rise and fall. There are reasons for their fall. Was September 11 part of this grand narrative of the history of New York that our golden age was over and 9-11 marked the beginning of the decline? Well, as a docent, I worked there from January 3rd, 1995 to August 7th, 2012. A total of 17 years. I'm amazed uh, looking back at how many years I spent guiding literally thousands of people through, generally on weekends, doing docent training for new exhibits. As the historical society tried to become a museum and to chronicle not just the past, but current events. 
So when September 11 happened, it was a moment that the directors of the historical society said, we have to have a constantly updated ongoing exhibit on what happened at 9-11. Well, of course, people were flocking to the historical society, sharing their stories. Well, what was happening at the historical society was what I call the first versions of 9-11. Issues came up, people brought up questions, People recounted anecdotes. My brother was there and this is what happened. My sister worked in the World Trade Center and this was her last phone call message. As before a hushed group at the Historical Society, we would listen to the very last words of this woman's sister before she was engulfed by the collapsing building. Stories came. Stories went, new accounts. Every Saturday, there was even more information to process as the narrative of what happened at 9-11 at continued to evolve. Well, 9-11, these were pictures which I took. This is the Queensboro Bridge. You can see in the distance, there's only one tower still standing. And as I stood there, that also collapsed. Well, as I was crossing from Queens into Manhattan, everybody in Manhattan was fleeing the city. So I was the only person who had jumped over the barricades and was running across the bridge and people were climbing on construction uh, machines, uh, piling into trucks, literally hanging on to the sides of vehicles as everybody was fleeing Manhattan. And it wasn't just the Queensboro Bridge, it was the bridges into Brooklyn as well. Up in Washington Heights, they were fleeing to New Jersey, escaping the city because nobody knew was this just the beginning of a systematic bombing raid against New York? Later, we discovered there was also a bombing raid on Washington and that there was another plane which was brought down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. But nobody knew what was going to happen. Were more buildings being targeted? What about the World Trade Centers? other buildings? What about the United Nations, the Empire State Building, Rockefeller Center, the iconic landmarks? What about the Statue of Liberty? Was that going to be next to go? We didn't know. But I was there taking pictures. These are my pictures of the buildings collapsing, the smoke. One on the left, you can see the Woolworth building with its pointed tower. And you can see all the people in the streets, the police blocking off uh, roads to keep people from getting even closer. Well, I took pictures because so much of what was happening would be lost in time. For example, we see the, um, one of the churches at Washington Square. Um, they uh, put up a sign in front saying the church is open, a pastor is there, and this is a moment for reflection. Other churches and other businesses put out water with little cups. On the right, we see Marble Collegiate Church, where there were people out front giving out drinks, everybody wondering what is happening, what is going to be next. So nobody knew what was going to happen. How will it all end? Is this the beginning of a world war? Are more planes on their way? Will it be the last time I will see the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty? Where in the great paintings by Thomas Cole was September 11? It clearly marked 
the point that we were no longer numero uno, we were no longer at the top. Something was happening. Would we remain the empire city? Would the United States remain number one? Or were we on our way down? Now, when we write the history of the Civil War, we have the official narratives. Thousands of books have been written. But it's always against the backdrop of we know who won. We know what happened to Abraham Lincoln. We know about Reconstruction, the Ku Klux Klan, and everything. But on that day of September 11 and the days following, we had no idea what was going to happen next. And that was what made those days so exciting for a person like me, a historian. What was going to follow? We didn't know. We didn't have the official account of 9-11. We have the official textbooks of the Civil War, the American Revolution, the Great Depression, but we don't know what was going to follow 9-11. Same situation as I speak to you. Are we at the very end of the COVID-19 pandemic? Is it grinding to a halt? Have we been victorious? Or is the United States going to be afflicted by still another outbreak of a new variant that would overcome my vaccinations and lead to more millions of people dead? And that was the exciting point of being a historian and being at the Historical Society and having witnessed 9-11. At that time, nobody knew how the story was going to end. The history of 9-11 was still an open book. So my Saturdays at the um, New York Historical Society as a docent were exciting. In fact, on September 11, the Historical Society had just reopened. They were eager to reinvent themselves. And most of the histori most of the docents were professional people, many of them still working, but many of them retired. Medical doctors, professors from Columbia University, lawyers, judges, teachers, historians. It was a high-powered group of very educated people. Now, we could say that we were the um, representatives of the highly educated New Yorkers, and we were New Yorkers. We wanted the truth. We wanted to hear stories. Very often, other people would talk as much during my tour as I did. And like New Yorkers, we were pushy, aggressive, we were ambitious. We weren't going to just say, we remain silent while the government came out with pronouncements. We're going to say, yes, well, that's what President so-and-so said, or that's what Governor so-and-so said, or Mayor Giuliani said this. But yesterday at the Historical Society, I heard a completely contradictory account. We were curious, we wanted to know, we were critical. We just didn't accept anybody's opinion about what was happening. We absorbed all the information and we came up with our own unique, highly educated and sophisticated approaches of what was happening. As we say, we don't take no shit from nobody in New York. You can try to convince us of something, but New Yorkers are going to form their own opinion. So what evolved during these, my Saturdays and everybody else's days at the Historical Society was a unique New York City view of 9-11. It was not one that was crafted in Washington by a bunch of politicians and spokespeople for the president. It wasn't crafted up in Albany by a bunch of politicians. It wasn't even crafted in City Hall under Giuliani, um, who gave the official New York City narrative. At the Historical Society, 
I was bombarded with everything from gossip and rumors, sp theories, speculation, survivors' accounts, rescue workers would give me their personal uh, um, uh, recollections. Policemen and women would be there saying what they were doing during the days, hospital workers, academics. It was, as the book on the right says, an oral history of 9-11. Well, of course, I was collecting these stories. In fact, New York City established what they call the Story Corps, where they would send vans around and record people's accounts of what was happening. I would be there for sometimes hours after my official tours ended, writing down the accounts that I heard, stories that I heard that I would need, never see in a New York Times or one of the tabloids or one of the major magazines or the evening news. And so these officially crafted accounts in newspapers and the news were only part of the story. And I was exposed as a docent and as spending 9-11 the day collecting stories from it, from people, I was exposed to a much more complete, much more complex than the official narrative of 9-11 that eventually emerged. Of course, people, time, Newsweek, business, uh, you know, all the other television shows, government pronouncements, President Bush statements, nightly news networks, all were trying to piece together what was happening to create what we can only call the official accounts of 9-11. But more and more, I began to realize that so much was being left out, that certain people were afraid to say certain things, that what was emerging was a sanitized account of what happened. Then very often I'd be watching the 6.30 news in my apartment and I would hear an interview with somebody and I would say, but that's not what I just heard the previous day at the historical society. There is another side to the story. So I became acutely aware of who will write the history of 9-11. What will be left out? Who will be left in? Who will be airbrushed out? So when we see the New York Historical Society Museum and Library making history matter, I thought that the word matter should be eliminated and it should be making history. On the right, you see some of the thousands of photographs and artifacts that historical society was accumulating to show that it was not just a historical society dealing with history, but 9-11 was contemporary history. So what were some of the stories that were left out and why were they left out? Well, the first issue that came up was heavily debated, even articles were published on it, but eventually was downplayed was the experimental nature of the architecture of many modern buildings, including the World Trade Center. On the left, you see the floor plan for the Empire State Building. You see in the center, typical, the, uh, all of the elevators and uh, conduits for water, electricity, gas, and air conditioning, and everything else. But those little black squares and rectangles and shapes which we see are the steel skeletons. Even between elevators, you see steel beams. So this World Trade Center was a cluster of steel beams around the outside, various uh, squares inside. It was a jungle of steel beams. Now, back when the Empire State Building was being built during the Great Depression, the ideal skyscraper was an office, 
Everybody wanted an office. They wanted a door that could be closed. Hopefully, they might even have a corner office with windows on both sides. If not, they would have maybe one window, but they wanted the privacy of an office with their name embossed on the door. The bigger your office, the more important you were. And having a private office with a door surrounded by four walls was a status symbol. So privacy was valued, secrecy was important. And so this reflected the age of the early skyscrapers, whether it is the Flatiron Building or whether it is the Woolworth Building, the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building. The emphasis was on individual privacy and four walls and a door with a brass plaque on the door with your name and your status. Well, the modern office building was the exact opposite. They wanted giant open spaces where you would have a cubicle. You could stand up and yell at the person next door. You could uh, exchange information. You had a chair on wheels. You could wheel it halfway across the floor and talk with your person next door. Even if there were partitions between areas, cubicles or even offices, they very rarely went to the ceiling. The goal was giant open spaces which could be arranged with temporary partitions uh, at will. And it could be changed. You could go into an office like the one we see on the left, uh, take out all the furniture, dismantle all of the cubicles, and you could turn the place into a party space. The corner you can see has a steel support, but the emphasis was on giant windows, very little support, much less steel. So on the right, we see the modern version. You have steel pillars around the outside. The inner core is express elevators, but open office space was at the premium. In fact, people say that they could get rid of all the cubicles and you could have a roller skating rink where everybody could go the whole way around the building without encountering one permanent wall, one steel pillar. And this is what people wanted, flexible uh, partitions that could be taken out, removed, and reinstalled at wish. Giant windows, very often going halfway across the side of the building. People wanted a view to wow their fellow workers and visitors. Well, this became very problematic. When we see, for example, articles like the Chicago Tribune, Nation and World, what made New York's Twin Towers collapse? December 6, 2001. The only thing that kept the building standing were the exterior columns and the columns in the beginning. And even the exterior columns were placed as far apart as they could get away with to have the maximum amount of glass so that you could have beautiful, magnificent views from the top of the 110th floor of the building. Which meant, as we're going to see in a minute, that when the plane hit the towers, they encountered almost no resistance. Maybe one or two pillars, glass wall, temporary office partitions, flimsy plastic furniture, and the airplanes plowed right into the center core, smashing through the elevators, pouring in tons of gasoline, igniting the building, the gasoline and petroleum going down in the tower, other floors, turning the building into a towering inferno. 
And this was widely reported by the Chicago Tribune and asked not only what made New York Twin Towers collapse, but what could make the majority of the new skyscrapers collapse? Was this faulty architecture? Was it experimental? Was it dangerous? Well, engineers, of course, did not want to hear this. I mean, if I was a engineer and had contracts to build skyscrapers, not only all over the United States, but all over the world, the last thing I wanted to hear that my new model for a skyscraper in Shanghai or Paris or Berlin, South Africa, Buenos Aires or Chicago was faulty. Well, the engineers were divided. Those who built the buildings and made their fortune from buildings wanted to hush hush the story. But there were, as you can see on the left, over 1,500 architects and engineers demand a real 9-11 investigation. And they established the architects and engineers for 9-11 truth. A uh, Washington Journal group questions 9-11 attacks on C-SPAN. Once again, architects and engineers for 9-11 truth. Well, this was not the kind of investigation groups who built skyscrapers wanted to hear. Whether it was the Port Authority of New Jersey, which country owned the World Trade Center, whether it was the National Institute of Building Sciences, Tishman Realty and Construction Corporation dating from 1921, American Concrete Institute, Nimuro Yamasaki Associates that built the tower, American Society of Civil Engineers. A real battle broke out between those who questioned the safety of these new ultra-modern skyscrapers and criticized them, and those who had invested billions of dollars in the World Trade Center, as well as so many of the other skyscrapers that were built using the same central core as a few as possible steel pillars around the outside and an open floor space. Well, when we look at a map today of New York, I mean, we see who won the battle. When we look at all these tiny, what we call pencil towers in New York, this is looking at um, the over Central Park toward the south. All of these tiny towers built for the central core, perimeter columns as few as possible, and a flimsy envelope of glass and plastic, no cement, no bricks, so that all of these towers, if they were hit by an airplane, would implode exactly the way the World Trade Center imploded. So of course, who won the battle? It was the construction, the engineers, the real estate developers. Because if these towers were found inadequate or dangerous, could you imagine the construction companies that would be sued, the architects, the investors, the bankers, the insurance companies, would be inundated with lawsuits. So it was into their advantage to hush up the whole issue of was the architectural design of 9-11 safe or was it an experimental? Well, of course, Homeland Security got involved. Documents were so-called redacted meaning anything referring to the experimental nature of the architecture was taken out. Many documents were simply not available. They were censored. Groups like Google, Twitter, Facebook, WeChat, TikTok, YouTube also had to be very careful what they said because they would be called on the carpet and even possibly sued 
for spreading fake news. Very often, information, documentation was withheld at the request of the government, spawning thousands of 9-11 conspiracy theories, and not just about 9-11, but the danger posed by modern architecture. Well, that didn't stop the growth of more and more World Trade Center style experimental buildings. That's me visiting the uh, Burj Khalifa Tower in the United Arab Emirates. Twice as tall as the Empire State Building, towering over a city where you can see the Persian Gulf on one side and you can see Saudi Arabia from the other side. Again, massive windows, as few pillars are on the periphery as possible, everything concentrated in the central core and open office spaces. Again, it shows that the architects, the engineers, the builders, the real estate developers managed to silence any further inquiry into the experimental nature of the building. Now, this was brought home when I would listen to telephone recordings about people saying, the stairways are blocked. I can't get out of the building. The heat is rising. This will be the last time you hear from me. Another issue that was very carefully controlled, censored, redacted was exactly how many people died. The standard figure, which was eventually agreed upon, was just shy of 3,000 people in the building and 19 hijackers. Well, this is the fact, the um, statistic which has been agreed upon as the official statistic of how many people died. Now, as I speak, we uh, are talking about how many people died in the United States because of COVID-19. And there was an article in the New York Times and another in the Wall Street Journal that said in countries like India or Brazil, the official statistic could be less could, could be multiplied by 40 or 50 percent. In the United States, they say that the official statistic, as I speak, it's about 600,000, is actually two or three times more. Who decides how many people are going to be listed as casualties? Well, again, the architecture comes into play. With all of the stairwells, the elevators, and everything in the central core, the airplane encounters almost no resistance until it smashes into the central core, dousing the stairways in gasoline, kerosene, or whatever the planes use, igniting it as the gasoline breaks other gas and electric pipes and conduits the whole central core explodes into flames. Well, that's also where the stairs are. So that means that as cables would collapse, piece of the airplane would collapse, walls would collapse, the stairs became blocked. Now, for somebody in their early 20s, they could jump over people lying in the there. They could even go through flames and um, jump over debris. But think of all of the elderly people who were, who maybe were handicapped. Think of all the women who go to the office wearing their nice, comfortable shoes, put their shoes in their desk drawer and put on their stiletto heels to appear like a real secretary. Suddenly, they're in another room. How can these people go down a hundred floors in stiletto heels? Think of the obese people, overweight, help people with heart conditions, unable to escape the buildings. And look at how narrow the stairway are. I mean, when you consider over a hundred floors of office space, even in the best of conditions, it would be almost impossible to evacuate the building 
in less than several hours. Flames shooting up from downstairs, blocking and burning, oil and gas lines breaking. And this was a major issue. How can we evacuate these giant towers if there is a fire, if there is some other disaster? Well, of course, a lot of work was done. People told me of their accounts of escaping the building or of stories from neighbors or of last telephone calls as someone was unable to get through the flames. Tony Nestor wrote, surviving a disaster, evacuation strategies and emergency kits for staying alive. Imagine if we would have had to evacuate Manhattan. As I saw when I was going the wrong way down the Queensboro Bridge to go to Manhattan, everybody else was fleeing. How many hours would it take to evacuate a giant building? like the new World Trade Center, or an entire island city, such as Manhattan. An issue in counting the number of uh, people who died is the large population of illegal and undocumented aliens who really keep the city functioning. Now, don't forget the World Trade Center was early morning. That's when the delivery men were delivering mail to the offices. The bus boys were doing their jobs delivering packages. Janitors were there tidying up the building for another day. The cleaners were still there packing up to go home. Window washers were gathering garbage men. Waiters, cooks, and construction workers were there. Think of all the illegal aliens, these guys who show up on a bicycle and deliver bagels and coffee, who deliver lunch, who are uh, catering companies or are setting up for a big office building, taking up cartons filled with food. Without the illegal and undocumented aliens, the city of New York would collapse. In fact, that keeps the prices down. I mean, if you had to hire legal people to deliver your mail and clean your offices at night, the price of running a business in New York would quadruple. You'd have to pay them social security. You'd have, they'd have to declare income tax. You'd have to provide them with health insurance. But when you are an illegal, you are afraid of arrest and expulsion. So what happened is, it's an estimated that there were at least 400, some people say it was up to 1,000 illegal aliens who were working in the World Trade Center when it was destroyed and whose families were afraid to talk to the police because they were afraid the family would then be arrested and expelled. So here again, how do you count the number of casualties? For example, with COVID-19, in New York, a casualty is counted when it is someone diagnosed with the COVID-19 virus who dies in a hospital. You die in a nursing home. You die on the street. You die at home. You are not counted which means that the 600,000 died in the United States is only a small proportion of those who actually did die. New York would literally collapse without illegal aliens. Now, when we think of illegal aliens, we think of uh, guys delivering bagels in the morning. We think of the meat industry in the Midwest. We think of California farm workers, but we re don't realize that construction workers in New York are largely illegal. Go to any supermarket at six o'clock in the morning and in a parking lot, you'll see a corner with all these South American illegals looking for a day's job. How many people are today dying because of COVID who are illegal or do odd jobs, whether it is working in nursing homes, in health 
care, um, home health aides who are, many of them are illegal. So here again, the whole 9-11 highlighted the issue of the centrality of illegal aliens to the American and especially the New York economy. In fact, just recently it was discovered that Donald Trump was hiring illegal aliens at his resort in Florida. So we remember those firefighters, those policemen, those nice office workers, but we forget the other hundreds, possibly thousands, who die not only from 9-11, but who are dying daily as I speak from COVID and who will probably die in mass numbers during the next hurricane, the next disaster, which will strike the United States. Every once in a while, you will see some makeshift candle, a little flag somewhere on the sidewalk with a name, sometimes even totally nameless, remembering those who do not appear in the official statistics. Now, Donald Trump, when he became elected, he tried to shut the door to immigrants, really deriding the Muslims, the Africans, the Latin Americans, closing the border. When he himself was a major employer of illegal aliens to keep his businesses going. Well, if we look at the chart on the left, when Donald Trump says, make America great again, he wants to go back to 1970. It was in 1965 that the Hart Seller Immigration Reform Act was enacted, which opened the door to immigrants. And today we see 2014, um, 30 per, 13 percent, 42 million immigrants flooding into the United States. Many of them are illegal. So even this number, these are the legal immigrants, but the huge number of illegals are not even mentioned. Another fascinating topic that became a major issue during my history uh, New York Historical Society tours was the story of the film crew. It was reported in the New York Times when a woman in New Jersey called the police and she said there are some strange Middle Eastern looking people on top of a parking garage who have set up big cameras and are filming the destruction of the World Trade Center jumping up and down, giving the V for victory sign. Well, of course, immediately the police and the FBI showed up and they captured the people, arrested them, and brought them to New York where they were held in jail for several months. Well, it ended up the lady was correct. They were Middle Eastern looking types, but it ended up that they were all Israeli Jews who were being kept in federal detention. Well, this was a major issue. It was picked up by the newspapers in San Diego, Houston, Kansas. More Israelis were ar arrested across the country. And the story was, was Israel involved in 9-11? an attempt to drag the United States kicking and screaming into its war against the Palestinians, a war against terrorism and the war against the Arab world. Well, if the New York Times is reporting it, and then I get people at historical society says, yes, my neighbors who were all Israeli, a bunch of young men renting an apartment, they all disappeared the very same day. What happened to this story? Of course, the Jewish community in the United States, the state of Israel, the American government was terrified 
by this arrest. Widely reported in the press, the dancing Israelis, the New York Times had a group of five men had set up a video camera aimed at the Twin Tower prior to the 9-11 attack and were congratulating multiple witnesses. Again, uh, immigration officials began deporting them. They even had their names. They admitted that they were working for the Israeli government, that they were sent over to report it. Well, you can imagine with the Jewish community in the United States, the question of relations with Israel, President uh, uh, Bush and his close association with Israelis, this was the kind of story that had to be hushed up at all cost. So eventually, it was the federal government which took control of the investigation. All of the materials, all of the information, all of the interviews, the sworn testimony by the Israelis was conveniently transported to Washington, where it has largely remained hidden. Well, this was fascinating because so many of the visitors in the Upper West Side were Jews and they were alarmed at what was happening, saying that Israel being involved in terrorism against the United States could very seriously endanger the status of Jews in America. Well, this was widely reported, the uh, Jewish foreword Newspapers since 1897 wrote extensive articles about spy rumors fly on gusts of truth. Sunday Herald in Britain, the Israelis were seen filming as jetliners plunged into the building. 200 young Israelis arrested, according to the Daily Telegraph. Well, how can you hush hush this story? Well, Donald Trump and many of people in the Israeli government conveniently ignored the fact that these were Israelis and tried to blame it on Muslims. In fact, Donald Trump's November 22, 2015 admitted that people were arrested, that they were celebrating the destruction of 9-11 but he had edited the account claiming that they were not Jews at all. They were not Israelis at all, that they were Muslim. So here again, we see a very careful reinterpretation of the events, changing, editing an official account to reflect the demands of Washington. ABC reported, were they spies? We see even Fox News, but arguing evidence linking these Israelis to 9-11 is now classified. It is classified information. Even if the um, Israeli newspaper, our Aretz, called it puzzling behavior, not using the word terrorism, not using the word attack, not using spies, but just puzzling behavior. 2008, who do you think was responsible? World average. Of course, by then, everything was being blamed on Al-Qaeda. Now, remember, this is world average. 46 blamed Al-Qaeda, who was behind it. U.S. government was blamed by 50% of world opinion. Third was Israel with 7%. Other 7%, 25% didn't know. But the whole involvement of Israel, to the extent that it ever happened, was classified information. The detainees, as they were called, were sent back to Tel Aviv. They disappeared, and this is another story that dare not speak its name. 
a lot of emphasis was given to Osama bin Laden's fatwa or legal uh, ruling of 1996, where he declared war against America for the American occupation of Saudi Arabia. Don't forget that during the September 11, the United States had 110,000 troops stationed in Saudi Arabia. Well, Osama bin Laden had good reason to be angry because Mecca and Medina, the two holy places, were under American military occupation. In his letter to America, Osama bin Laden wrote, Zionist Crusader Alliance and their collaborators for aggression against Muslims in many countries and U.S. support of Israel as the reasons for the destruction of the World Trade Center. So the eventual account agreed, and it is true for all the information we are privy to, that it was organized by Osama bin Laden. He had declared war. He blamed the United States for its occup military occupation of Saudi Arabia, for the occupation uh, and of the West Bank by Israel. So he had very good reason. So gradually over time, the Israeli element, the film crew, which posed a lot of questions was removed from the narrative. But then again, at the Historical Society on my Saturday morning talks, especially Jewish Americans were very alarmed. They talked about people accusing them of being complicit in 9-11, even supporting Osama bin Laden. And so gradually though, this aspect, like the faulty architecture, like the number of people killed, was removed from the narrative. George W. Bush joined in the Israeli war on terrorism or war on Islam. Afghanistan was invaded, Iraq was invaded, the government in Libya was uh, overthrown. The Muslim Sharia ban in the United States, as many people called it, waterboarding in Iraq, um, uh, war crimes, uh, toilet paper rolls with quotations from the Quran, uh, protesters in New York and major cities, every real Muslim is a jihadist. I mean, the focus was on Osama bin Laden, and it was expanded to include the entire Muslim world. For example, uh, Afghanistan, which had harbored Osama bin Laden, was targeted and joined with most European NATO countries. But he expanded the war to Iraq and Libya, which had absolutely nothing to do with the war. And so the official narrative of 9-11 basically eliminated the Israeli film crew, which was too delicate, too explosive. It was classified information and no longer appears in the official accounts. And in fact, when you go to something like Wikipedia, the Israeli film crew is now almost declared as fake news, and it is part of the conspiracy theories, as if it never happened and put it in the same Wikipedia article as aliens and um, uh, messiahs. But the bond between Israel and the United States survived this episode, and as we saw with Donald Trump, the Israeli American bond emerged more stronger than ever under President Donald Trump. So we get to the point of writing the official history of 9-11. When you visit the site of the World Trade Center, as you see it today with the greenery, the footprint of the two towers, the museum, in fact, they don't even call it a museum. 
It is a memorial, a place of remembrance, which sort of absolves them from even claiming to be a reputable history account. It is a place of remembrance. It is emotional. It is a memorial with all of the religious implications that that involved, a place to ponder. And so the official narrative given in such updated editions of the 911 Memorial Booklet, the official book of the National September 11 Memorial. Emphasis here on official account. Who writes the official account? What is left out? What is ignored? What is censored? What is included? What numbers are included? Here again, we are no longer dealing with real history. We are dealing with the official narrative. We see, welcome to the Nine Memorial Preview Site, Visitor's Guide for Adults, Visitor's Guide for Truth Seekers. Welcome to the other story of 9-11. Here again, we're admitting at the memorial that it is still in many ways an open question. Who writes the narrative? Are there different narratives? And here we see on the left, the memorial. It is almost like a church with an altar or a memorial or a bima behind it. It is not a place for history. It is a place for reflection. Now, it's interesting with the posters, the two uh, brochures, 911 Memorial, but the one on the left, they have since added the word museum to try to give it a little bit more um, acceptance as a reputable, uh, authentic account of 9-11. Of course, we had the official government version in 2004, the 911 Commission Report. Many books were written about that uh, path to 9-11, the looming tower, once again, reflecting the official narrative. But what happened to all of those lost chapters? The 911 Contradictions by David Ray Griffin. Noam Chomsky's account of 9-11, famous professor of linguistics at MIT. Conspiracy theories. Well, this is what happened to the lost chapters, the official death, faulty architecture, the Israeli involvement. These were aspects of the story that did not survive and find a place in the official account. Now, there were books that, of course, Noam Chomsky is a reputable historian, but still, not um, uh, accepted by official versions of 9 11. 911 contradictions is rather a, uh, um, a delicate way of dealing with it. But most of these lost chapters and many others, which I didn't even talk about today, have been relegated to places like Wikipedia, conspiracy. Theories. And here we see one conspiracy theories. What are the common conspiracies surrounding 9 11? The architecture was perfectly safe. The correct number of people were killed, no illegal aliens. The police did not involve in looting of jewelry stores on the ground floor. The building architecture was not a major issue. There was no Israeli film crew there. They were, according to Donald Trump, Muslims after all. Well, Donald Trump and his version of history wrote in the Washington Post, there were people that were cheering on the other side 
where you have a large Arab population. Well, they were cheering. So sometimes he calls them Muslims, sometimes he calls them Arabs, but it is clear that the Israelis have been eliminated from the story. Well, Washington Post fact checker analyzed this quote and called it a lie. TVM News say Trump debunked. But still, the true history of 9-11 remains, but it is relegated to you know, obscure historians, obscure books that are not in most libraries, conspiracy websites along with aliens, and have been airbrushed out of the history. Now, this is not a um, incident that is limited to the September 11. The Warren Commission report, once again, the official report of President's Commission on the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. So much had to be taken out of the story to create the sanitized crazy gunman scenario, not linking the assassination with uh, any other group. QAnon, the great source of uh, um, conspiracy theories, who was behind the murder of Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, Sandy Hook, whole issue of gun control, where you get the crazy lone gunman scenario, which is generally applied to any inconvenient mass killing. Today, we are enduring the very same situation, the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, here again, is it a conspiracy theory? Was it involved in a, was it developed in a lab in China and escaped? Who knows? Will we ever know? Well, we will very soon get the official version of COVID-19, but we will have the Chinese version, we'll have the European version, we'll have the American Republican version, the American Democrat version. I mean, uh, what we read as the official history is simply the official Washington theory, and that could claim, uh, change from one administration to the other. Same issue is happening with Donald Trump's claims that the election fraud deprived him of the presidency. Again, are we ever going to know the truth behind the election? Democrats investigate, they come to one conclusion, ignoring certain aspects, the Republicans, uh, scholars. So what we get as history is simply a very well-constructed narrative reflecting the values, the goals of a particular group. And this happens in all museums. We see the uh, book by Carl Mayer, The Art Museum, Power, Money, and Ethics. What artist is going to be highlighted? Which artist is going to be given prominence? Which one is going to be ignored? Which monuments are going to be torn down? Should um, Columbus Circle and the Columbus Day Parade be abolished? Once again, who writes the history of America? Who tells the story of George Washington, the great, or I should say, mediocre general, great president and slave owner. Here again, just as the architects, the engineers and the builders decided that the architectural uh, deficiencies of the World Trade Center should be censored from the official narrative. So it is the same with museums, with memorials. Whole host of books have been written, money, 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 and museums. 
when you go to the American Indian Museum in Lower Manhattan, it is a Smithsonian government controlled museum. You go to the Holocaust Memorial, it is a Jewish museum. Go to a Chinese in America Museum in New York. You get one version of Chinese history, gay and lesbian episodes in history. Who writes the history? An evangelical Protestant minister is going to have a very different view of gay and lesbians in American history than a very liberal gay and lesbian group. So it is just not the World Trade Center that has its own various histories. And the official government history, but it is every ethnic group, every museum, the Holocaust Museum, the Chinese in America, every museum is a victim of the forces of politics and especially money in crafting, in shaping its own version of history. Well, today we talk a lot about fake history, the 10 great lies at how they shape the world. I mean, we are still becoming more and more aware of how history is made. It's probably the most convoluted sausage making system in the world. And it is not just in the United States, it is every country in the world. Alien abduction files. Here again, this just came out recently where the government was starting to reveal documents. It's secret archives about alien abductions. Well, will the government ever reveal everything it has? Who will analyze them? Who will write the official history? Well, I'm just waiting for the aliens to arrive and give us their side of the story. Now, I think that would be a fascinating new chapter into the stories of alien abduction. So that brings us to an end. Once again, this is Dr. Ronald Brown. You can reach me at ronbrownmedia at gmail.com if you would like to add anything. If you have any um, comments you would like to add, any criticisms or anything else, please feel free to contact me. And I'm always eager to upgrade my programs. So. Thank you very much for joining me. And I hope that you will join me in the future for other um, it, uh, presentations on history, religion, politics, New York, and so many other related topics. So once again, this is Dr. Ronald Brown signing off. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.